Uh, just like last week and every week through our Christmas series, we are going to open our message time with some special music this week. Linda and Tim are going to be playing an Ave Maria by Bach and Gno. And this is just a time where we get to let that melody, to, get, to let that thing draw us up, draw us into what God has for us in this season. So let's enjoy this together.
there is something just deeply moving in those sounds as they draw us into what God has for us. So last week, Michael kicked off our Christmas vinyl series telling the story of a man named Zachariah. And that ended in Zachariah's song, Zachariah's vinyl, as it were. And the story went a little something like this. Zachariah was a priest, and while Zachariah was serving in the temple, he met an angel. And the angel came to Zachariah. And that's amazing. And then the angel tells Zachariah that, Zachariah, you're going to be a father. And this, again, even more amazement, because Zachariah is an old, old man. And then not only is Zachariah going to be a father, Zachariah is going to be a father to the one who prepares the way for the Messiah, the coming king. So the background there, for those of you who don't know, that, that in Israel there was a promise, there was a prophecy of a king that was going to come, was going to come and save the people, and that there would be one who went before that king to prepare the way. And it's that man that Zachariah was going to be the father to. Incredible, amazing promises. And Zachariah in that moment doesn't believe it. And as a result, Zachariah is struck dumb and he's silent until the baby is born. And then Zachariah gets his voice back and he sings this song. Now in telling that story, there's probably about half of us, not half of us, half of you in the room who think, oh, there's probably something missing in that story. For the other half of us, that's about nine months to catch us up there. You see, there's a piece in this story that we missed last week. And it's in that space that we're going to talk this morning. And we're going to talk about what happened with Elizabeth, with Zachariah's wife. If you've got a Bible, it's in Luke chapter 1, so we're going to go there in a second, but before we do that, let's pray together. Father God, we pray as we come to your word this morning, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would illuminate these words to us, that they would change us, they would transform us, they would make us more like your son, Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. So, let's jump in. This is in Luke chapter 1, verses 24 and 25. It's on the screens. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can follow along there. We read this. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me, to take away my reproach among people. Those opening three words, after these days, this locates it in that story of Zechariah. After Zechariah has had this angel encounter, this is then where we go in the text to meet with Elizabeth. Now, I'm pretty sure this isn't how it happened, but, but in my mind, when I think about this, I think, okay, so Zechariah finishes his day at the temple, whatever that looks like. Now he's lost his voice, and he goes home. And then what ensues is quite possibly the kind of most incredible game of charades you could ever imagine. So Zachariah then has to communicate to his wife, okay, so I've seen an angel somehow, so he's got the angel. Then he's like, and you're going to be pregnant? That's going to be weird because she's old too, so she's got to somehow try and get a hold of that. Then you're, the, the baby is going to somehow be like the one who prepares the way for the king. I mean, this is just this incredible, crazy moment that's happening for Elizabeth. Probably he just wrote it down, but, but in my mind, that's, that's what happened, you know. Now, whatever happened, let's just think about Elizabeth for a second. See, she now has to wait. I think maybe some faith came in that moment, but she has to wait. Think about what's been promised to her. And then the days start to tick by. And the days turn into weeks. And then things start changing. And oh, something might actually be happening. And then maybe that faith grows and the weeks turn into months. And she's wondering in her old age, could this be real? And then we reach that point that we read in the text and she makes this statement. N.T. Wright says it this way. She says, at last God has looked on me and taken away my public shame. You see, because in the context here, Elizabeth as a woman with no children, 
would be in a place of public shame. Within the community, it was believed that if you didn't have children, the reason for that was because of something you had done wrong, because of God's judgment on your life, because of some sin that you had committed. And that would have been a place of shame. This idea actually came out of Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 14, where there was a verse that God spoke to the people of Israel, where he said, to the entire nation of Israel, God says, as you go into the land, if you obey my commandments, then there will be no barrenness amongst you, not the animals, not the people. But what has happened to that promise? That national promise had been misrepresented and made into an individual statement for Elizabeth, for individuals, where it said that if individually you are barren, then it's because of a sin you've done. It was misquoted, it was misrepresented. Justo Gonzalez, in his commentary, actually points out that it made no sense even within the history of Israel. Because in the history of Israel, barren women appear repeatedly in the scriptures. Sarah, Rebecca, and Rachel were all called barren. Yet by the grace of God, the lineage of Abraham, the father of all Israel, was preserved through them. Samson, the judge, Samuel, the prophet, were born of barren women. It was misapplied. It didn't make sense. It wasn't even true of Rebecca. In verse 6, we read this, of not of Rebecca. It wasn't even true of Elizabeth. In verse 6, it says that she was righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Yet in this space, she still felt that shame. She still felt it. Despite the fact that it wasn't true, despite the fact that it was misapplied, misappropriate, ununderstood, didn't make sense, she still believed it. Is that a space that you know yourself? A space where you know feelings of shame. Feelings of not being enough. Maybe it's for that very same reason as Elizabeth. Cultural connotations have changed, but yet that pain of not being able to have children might be very real for you. Maybe it's something else. Shame because of something that you have done, something in your past, or something that has been done to you. Do you know that same space that Elizabeth knew? Last week, when Michael spoke, we learned how hopelessness is the birthplace of hope. This week, as we consider Elizabeth's story and her place and her space of shame, we get to see that there are first steps there that shame can become the birthplace of favor. In fact, we see it even in these opening verses. There are those four words in verse 25. He looked on me. God looked on Elizabeth. That word there, looked, it's not just he looked as in he looked and saw the sunset or he looked and saw you know, the sound booth at the back of the room. No, it's a personal word. He, God, looked on her. He saw her. He knew her in the space that she was. That's what God brings in this space. But the story doesn't end there. It continues. If we jump down to verse 39, we're going to read together in a minute. Verse 39 opens with these words, in those days Mary. So Mary now is introduced into the story. We know Mary. This is next week's story. Actually, Beth is going to talk about Mary next week. But we we tend to know Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary at this point has received her own angel visitation. She's conceived by the Holy Spirit, the Savior of the world. And we read this in verse 39. In those days, Mary arose, went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah, She entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, and then this is her song, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, 
the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now this morning, we don't want to rush from what's happening here. So often we read these verses and we rush forward to actually what follows, which is Mary's song and then the birth of Jesus. But this moment that we're in right here, in this story, outside of Mary's meeting with the angel, this is the very first encounter anyone has with Jesus. This, if you want to say it, is the the first gospel encounter. And I think about Elizabeth. Think about Elizabeth who's been waiting, thinking about those promises, knowing that it could be true as this baby grows within her. But then does the final piece fall into place? When that baby leaps in her, when she is filled with the Holy Spirit and she knows the one who her son is to prepare the way for has come in that moment to her. The king, the promised king, the Messiah, God with us, Emmanuel, in that moment, she knows that it is him. And this king who has come is a king like no other. Luke's gospel, one of the themes in Luke's gospel is this theme of the great reversal of what happens when this king comes. As you read through Luke's gospel, we hear the reversal of rich and of poor, of proud and of humble, of strong and of weak. And in this moment, there's a reversal of greater and lesser. Because what was the, what was the custom in those days? In those days, it was the lesser that went to the greater. If you wanted to see the king, you had to go to the king. But what do we see in this moment? In this moment, in this space, we have a king like no other. It's a king who comes to us. It's a king who doesn't stay remote and wait for us to earn our way, to do something to get to them. No, it's a king that comes. And this, this is the gospel. This is the gospel that we aren't just seen. God doesn't just see us from heaven looking down or wherever. He's not just distant. No, the gospel is that the king comes to us. And when we receive him, then we know favor. Then everything changes. The ESV that we read it from actually kind of sells it a little bit short in verse 43 when it says, in this, and this was granted to me. That this is this honor. You read it in another version. It says, this honor was granted to me. This favor was granted to me. That the king would come. Maybe this morning you're here. You've come with a friend. Who knows? Maybe what you need to hear this morning is that you are seen. That the king has come to you. And that you can know him. You, whoever you may be. Whatever your walk of life. Whatever your status however ordinary you may think you are, however dismissed you think you may be. Again, this is the great reversal we see in the text here. In those opening three words in verse 39, in those days, they actually even speak of a reversal that's happening. They refer us back actually to verse 26. See, when Michael was talking last week about Zechariah, He opened us up as Luke does, and Luke opens us up in his gospel here in chapter one, and he talks about, in the very first five verses, he talks about how Herod, how Herod was reigning. Herod was the king. Herod was, he was under Roman rule. This was the state of things. But that's not the days that Luke refers us back to in verse 39, because something changes in verse 26. In verse 26, the narrative shifts. Luke's about to talk about Mary receiving the announcement. Luke's about to start talking about Jesus. And what do we read in verse 26? In verse 26, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Listen to what Caitlin Shy says about this. She says, stories are regularly situated by the rise and fall of powerful men. But the story of the coming of the incarnate Son of God is situated by the number of months that this lowly woman has been pregnant. Think about that for one second. The greatest gift that was ever given 
in all history. Situated in the pregnancy of Elizabeth. The coming of the incarnate Son of God. As we read in that ver- those verses, what was the first indication? The kicking of a baby in a womb. This is the great reversal. This is who our God is. In the greatest story of all time, it's available to us all. N.T. Wright says this, the story is about the great fulfillment of God's promises and purposes, but the needs, the hopes and fears of ordinary people are not forgotten in this larger story, precisely because of who Israel's God is, the God of lavish, self-giving love. When this God acts on the larger scale, he takes care of smaller human concerns as well. At this pivotal moment in all history, Elizabeth's identity, the place that she'd been living, that place of shame that she had known, God sees her. And in that place of shame, there is the birthplace of favor, that she knows that she is beloved by God. I want to look at two things quickly in this space of transformation. I want to look at how it happened and what was the result. See, this didn't happen to Elizabeth when she was just alone, waiting there. It happened when Mary came. I would say it happened in community. You see, we are called to live throughout the Bible. We see that the Christian life is not a life of solitary wandering by yourself. It is interacting with others. It's in community. It's being drawn together in space. We know that we are designed to need other people in our lives. But even more than that, I would say here that actually what we see is that it is in spirit-filled community that we get to experience these transformations. Think what could have happened here. This could have been very, very different. Think about the, we just read so quickly through this, but think about the players and what's happening. Elizabeth, the wife of a priest, is visited by Mary, an unwed, pregnant teenager. Actually, the expectation would be that Elizabeth looked upon Mary with contempt for the place she found herself. But yet she didn't. Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit. Even more than that, as Mary tells Elizabeth her story, Elizabeth is is carrying John, the one who will prepare the way. That's an amazing story. Mary one-ups that story. We've all been in that situation, right, where you tell a story and somebody else then kind of overtells a story over the top of you. But how did Elizabeth respond? There was no envy. There was no jealousy. There was community. They were drawn in together. They discovered community where healing could happen, where change could happen, where what the world put on these two women of shame in their positions actually welled up to favor. That's the kind of community we want. That's why when we gather each week, we pray at the end. Because in community, healing can happen. It's why we have healing prayer. We have classes, changes that heal, the cure. It's why we do emotional wholeness workshops. Because in community, in spirit-filled community, change, transformation can happen. I love the title of our our last emotional wholeness workshop, Triggers, Trauma, and Triumph. That triumph is so important, right? This is what community is about. This is what spirit-filled community is all about. Healing, cure, wholeness, triumph. 
You see, spirit-filled community is not just about kind of fixing things. It's not purely about the therapeutic. That's a part of it. But spirit-filled community is meant to be so much more. It's meant to produce triumph. It's meant to produce something more, something actually to be praised and to be worshipped. And that's the result that we see here in this encounter between Elizabeth and Mary. What happens? It bubbles up into exuberant praise and worship. It erupts between them. We kind of miss it when we read the words because we just read them on the page. It's like, and, you know, blessed are you, and there was joy. No, this is exuberant praise that bubbles up in this space. Um, You may not be aware of this, but there's a rather large global tournament happening at the moment known as the World Cup. I know this isn't quite the audience, but, um, but, you know, but it's happening. There's a couple of people that appreciate it. Now, I'm not going to reference what happened to the US yesterday, and I'm not going to hope for what's going to happen to England later today, but I was watching a game the other day. South Korea was playing Portugal. South Korea has won the game, two to one, but they don't know that they're going to make it through to the next round because there's another game that's happening at the same time, another game that's happening between Uruguay and Ghana, and they have to wait these players, until the last few minutes of that game happen. And if you were watching it, actually you see the players, they're laying on the ground, watching just like just the digital thing as the time ticks along. Desperately hoping that the result will hold, that they'll go through in the next round. And it flicks over to full time. And these players erupt, they jump up, and it's an incredible scene. You know what completed that scene for me? It was getting to text my friend John Kim. You may know John and Sonny who go here. From South Korea. And we got to celebrate together in that moment what had happened. Because actually enjoying something is really only consummated when you go into that space with somebody else. Here's how C.S. Lewis says this. C.S. Lewis said it like this. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses, but completes the enjoyment. It is its appointed consummation. It's not out of compliment that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. Isn't that right? Isn't that what we get to see here with Mary and with Elizabeth when they come together? Spirit-filled community and exuberant praise. As I was getting ready for this message, it was in a compressed time because of everything else that has been going on. It's been, uh, it's been a tough few weeks for the church. As you saw today again, Michael had to make another pastoral announcement. But I think that what we see here can speak into this. Because Luke, when he writes his gospel, he then actually writes a follow-up volume, the book of Acts. And they're parallel stories. And actually what you see in the start of Luke is where you see the Holy Spirit moving upon Mary, moving upon Elizabeth and the birth of Jesus. In Acts, you see the Holy Spirit coming in Pentecost, moving on the church, falling upon Jews and Gentiles alike, and the birth of the church as it goes out. See, I couldn't help, but as I'm reading these verses, I couldn't help but think about the church. I love the church. I love the church global. I love the church local. I love this church, where we are. In fact, I can't think about a place that I would rather be during these weeks than in church. Spirit-filled community exuberant praise, what we got to experience this morning as we came together in worship, as we were led so well. There is nothing like this place. Church. I mean, this church, I love this church, but church. There's no other place where last week, when two families who have both lost a mother come into the same place and they hold each other that little bit tighter, 
They have an opportunity to respond at the end, to know the Spirit coming. I've been at two funerals this week. At both funerals, we sang, How Great Thou Art. This is that space we step into. We're in the midst of all that's happening. In the midst of whatever's going on in life. Oh Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. This is the space we get to live. This is what we see in the story of Mary and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, as she sings her song, 